Hello and welcome to Greenfleet Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for our discussion today. I'm delighted to be joined by David Savage, Associate Vice President for the UK and Ireland at Geotab. Hi David. Hi Kate, great to be here. Good, great, great for you to join us. Uh, by way of introduction, David, could you tell me a little bit more about Geotab? So Geotab started in the year 2000, based out of North America, uh, focused on fleet telematics and all of the benefits that telematics can bring to fleets, whether that is efficiency, um, improving operational capabilities, driver behavior, et cetera. Um, and over that time, we've now grown to be the largest fleet telematics player in the world, uh, covering 130 uh, countries across the globe. Uh, over 45,000 different uh, customers, and we now have our device in over 2.5 million vehicles across the globe. Um, and for the last 14 years or so, we've been heavily involved in EV and sustainability and understanding how telematics can help um, fleets make that transition, and that point has now come. Uh, indeed, indeed. And, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, so we're looking at the growth of electric vehicles and what more needs to happen in that transition to mass market. Um, the uh, latest figures from the SMMT show that battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles reached 17% share of new vehicle registrations in July of this year. Um, which is phenomenal, uh, you know, and it, the, the growth is really incredible. But what would you say are, are the main reasons that the EV sales have been picking up? Sure. So, look, there's probably been a, a few key reasons that have really helped escalate that growth trajectory that we've seen with electric vehicle adoption really over the last couple of years. You know, we're really delving into the figures now, but actually the growth has been going on for a little period of time now. So firstly, I think we can point to the early adopter fleets uh, who are really demonstrating the viability of electric vehicles, not just in terms of range, which is always a big concern in the past, but also the price point now, uh, particularly as it pertains to EVs in comparison to their internal combustion engine counterparts. Um, from a consumer perspective, I think it's clear to see that they're increasingly becoming aware of the total cost of ownership and how electrification needs to be viewed through that lens rather than just the upfront cost. Um, so really looking at that lifetime ownership cost, as well as the environmental benefits of uh, you know, clean motoring, it's really both an ethical and an economic win-win um, situation for both consumers and businesses alike. The other point, which I think is really important, is the infrastructure piece. So infrastructure network had always been a concern, and it still is a concern, let's be honest about it but it's improving dramatically. Uh, we're seeing a much greater availability of charging options, uh, particularly with those without the benefit of off-street parking, which has always been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. And fleets are really beginning to utilize more forms of charging infrastructure as they get to understand the nuances and availability of the, the options in market to really better suit their needs. Um, and in fact, I think we can point to some recent studies that show that UK businesses are planning to invest more than 15 billion um, pounds in electrifying their fleets. And around a third of that investment is going to go into home charging options uh, for employees in the coming years. And I think it's fair to say that that's really been driven by the fact that we've all been working from home for 18 months. And um, <laughs> that's, you know, pretty much where a lot of the offices are now based. Yeah, and it and it's good value for money as well in terms of the cost of that charge point and that get almost guaranteed access and reliability. It's it's a it's a no brainer, but it's a phenomenal amount of money that that these businesses look into invest, which is great. Um, so if I flip that that question on its head a little bit and say. Uh, 17 17% 17 uh, market share of new vehicle registrations is great news, but of course that still means that 83% are still choosing to buy uh, an o, uh, uh, an EV, an ICE over an EV. So, you know, why why are businesses still investing in ICE? Certainly, in our experience, it's becoming much less the case. You know, there's a very much a concerted push towards fleet electrification. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that in the past, you know, perhaps a bit of a deterrent towards that had been the perceived cost of fleet electrification. Um, and like you could probably also accompany that with some of the misconceptions surrounding range anxiety, which have been very much addressed by the new models coming to market. 
um, and the overall performance of EVs. So it can be quite a challenge to, to really overcome these. And from our perspective, we see that as being driven by a lack of data or lack of understanding of the data. Um, that if viewed correctly can really provide the insights to demonstrate the true benefits of fleet electrification. Um, and I think the important aspect to when you're looking at fleet electrification is a big concern is, do we have to do it all at once? And actually, it's almost impossible to electrify a fleet all at once. Yep. Uh, you really need to understand the performance of your existing fleets, the kind of the, the payloads it's carrying, the topographies it's going over, the, the ranges it's covering, the driver behavior. Um, and that's why a few years ago, we created what we call our electric vehicle suitability assessment to really help fleets on that transition. So very basic level, we can gather all of the data from the existing vehicles within a fleet, digest all of that, allow the end user to customize it based on temperature ranges, um, cost uh, brackets that they're looking at, et cetera, and then output a recommendation. And I think, you know, the more the end customers see that platform or that tool, the more they recognize that fleet transition needs to be a staggered approach. So certainly for the next decade, maybe even a little bit more, we know there's a ban coming in 2030 on the sale of internal combustion engine um, vehicles, but certainly for probably the next decade or so, there's going to have to be a marriage of both yep. um, within a fleet. And whilst you'll be looking at different data points um, between internal combustion engines and electric fleets, you're going to see an increased weighting towards electric vehicles within a fleet and a decrease in um, petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, we know that a lot of fleets are at the very start of that journey. You know, many are at single digit transition of their vehicles within that fleet. Some are much further advanced, but it's, uh, it takes time. And, you know, there's more and more vehicles coming to market as we touched upon charging infrastructure is improving. Um, and the government are also playing their part in, in driving that transition using a bit of a, a stick and a carrot approach. So on the stick side of it, you've got the ban on internal combustion vehicles by 2030, uh, ultra low emission zones, you know, in London and now migrating across the UK. Uh, and then there's the government incentives, tax breaks um, and salary sacrifice schemes, which are relatively new as well. My, my favorite topic. So uh, so if I so if we think about um, your uh, the, the fleets who who still have this perception uh, about range and vehicle suitability, um, uh, hence your um, electric vehicle suitability assessment tool. Um, if if we're at uh, seventeen percent new registrations now, you know today, if every single fleet was required to complete your assessment, what what roughly how many vehicles would you say? could be electric today? Very good question. Um, and we've recently undertaken a pretty widespread UK-based uh, electric vehicle suitability assessment. And, and again, this is looking at commercial fleets. Yep. Um, and from our insights, around 40% of vehicles within a commercial fleet currently could make the transition to uh, an electric vehicle. And that is factoring in range, temperature parameters, et cetera. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty marked increase. You know, we tend to do this exercise on a fairly regular basis. And as we touched upon earlier on with the SMMT figures, you know, we ran this exercise a year ago and the figures weren't even as close to that now. Um, and this is really because the vehicle manufacturers are bringing more vehicles to market with improved battery technology, et cetera. And that's, that's really helped um, act as a real catalyst. Yeah, okay. And, and that, that doesn't surprise me because the choice, the vehicle availability, the range, and probably crucially the uh, the number of uh, all electric vans coming onto the market has has suddenly improved. So um, by um, by twenty twenty five, we're going to see that that forty percent figure, um, hopefully much higher. Which of course it needs to be uh, with this twenty thirty deadline in mind. Uh, and do um, uh, of course that 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 does that presuppose that um, uh, they have to be geotab custom existing telematics customers to go through that assessment or uh, do you work with all kinds of fleets 
you can ingest data, but typically it works better if there's a, a geotab device um, in the vehicle uh, to help us build up that comparable, that comparable knowledge. But the great thing about it is, you know, we work with, we can look at all vehicle types. Um, and actually, once the fleet has gone, made that transition to electric vehicles, the next big step is how do you operate electric vehicles? Mm. Um, and that's sometimes part of the conversation that doesn't quite happen because we're still at the very early stages of that, but that's, you know, equally important. And, you know, there's around, around 250, 260 different electric vehicle makes and models now available on market. And we've got 180 of those fully supported and are adding around 30 per quarter. So we're, we're catching up pretty quickly with the market, which is moving at pace. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say you've got you're going to have your work cut out for some time yet. I, I know that, but it is crucial to to be uh, agnostic, a vehicle agnostic, to be able to provide um, whole data. So thinking, uh, just kind of um, expanding on what you just said. Um, a lot of the conversations over over the last decade, uh, not surprisingly, have been focused on oh, what's the choice of vehicle, uh, you know, and I'm and, and very much focused on the spec of the vehicle and maybe some discussion about the recharging equipment. Um, but I, you know, I think you you suggested it. Um, uh, it just then that actually there are a lot of other aspects that businesses need to consider um, before they switch to EV. Can you just give us give us your thoughts on um, what else businesses need to be considering, you know, not just which vehicle, which hardware? Sure. So look, the vehicle is the paramount one because that is the workhorse, um, you know, within the organization. And you want to ensure maximum uptime so that, you know, you're, it's acting as a revenue generator and not, you know, a, an unnecessary cost. Um, the charging aspect is something that is getting a lot of focus and quite rightly so, because um, there's been challenges there, whether it's investment from the private or public sector that is now being addressed. I think the one area that isn't always necessarily spoken about, but is also very important to really positive fleet electrification is driver education. Now, if we think about from a commercial vehicle perspective, you know, you're going to have drivers who are used to a certain type of vehicle, probably spent years, if not decades, driving in a certain way. Um, and yet when you jump into an electric vehicle, the controls look similar, but the behavior required to get the best output from them can be somewhat different. You know, for example, you know, if you wanted to slow down your car, the natural reaction is to hit the brake. Actually, in an electric vehicle, you might just come off the accelerator and, you know, the car, the vehicle will take care of itself. Um, so, you know, I think that's really an important component that shouldn't be overlooked because it's going to help driver education is going to help improve range. And it's also going to minimize the, the level of maintenance required on the vehicle as well. Yeah. Um, and, and over we, a period we, of time. And we and we've talked about you know with this with this driver behaviour and the and the education, you know, be really kind of um, a little bit more forethought in terms of the the recharging. You know, what what's the plan for recharging? Uh, and and I, you know, from discussions that I've had, that may mean that you have to adapt existing processes and operations um, to 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 allow that to happen. Um, is that is, is that something that you can help with as well? Yeah, that's absolutely something that we can that we can uh, overlay our expertise and help support on. So there's you know there's the charging infrastructure piece. There's uh, route optimization, which is is paramount. You obviously want to minimise the distance from A to B, um, so that you're maximising the range. So yeah, pretty much every aspect of it is um, is something that GeoTab uh, can support on. Good, good, good. And uh, so let, let's let's shift the focus a little bit because um, uh, this is Greenfleet, and we often talk about what businesses need to do to reduce vehicle emissions. Um, but increasingly, I think people are becoming aware that local authorities have a role to play to maximise EV uptake. Um, you know, what what are your thoughts on what what local authorities? Um, need and must be doing? I think local authorities need to lead from the front. You know, if you're going to set the rules, you need to follow them. 
you need to exemplify them. Um, and I remember reading a stat, I can't remember exactly where it was, but if we, we look at kind of government or public sector fleets within the UK, they're about seven or eight percent towards, you know, full fleet electrification, which is lagging a little bit behind the, the private sector. So, you know, that's, that's something I think that um, needs to be considered. So, as I said, you know, drive leading from the front, really. Um, continuing that investment in their, their own localized fleet of electric vehicles. Um, I think continuing the introduction of clean air zones mm. as well. You know, we, we've got quite a few in London where I'm based at the moment, and we know they're starting to make their way across the, the UK, although arguably we could be moving quicker. Um, and then look at other incentives to, to drive EV adoption, whether that is free parking for EV drivers or a reduced rate for parking within, you know, uh, publicly available parking areas within the, the inner cities, um, as well as making charging infrastructure or charging more available, um, whether that is through public sector or public-private sector partnership, you know, making it easier for the private sector to work with the public sector. Um, and I think when we look at electrification, I guess quite naturally, when we look at population density, we're very much focused on the urban areas. But where I live in suburbia, there's, you know, the charging infrastructure isn't quite where it is compared to London. The number of EVs isn't quite the, the same level as it is. So um, we need to look at this very holistically, urban, suburban, public-private sector partnerships, and um, it's going to require a concerted and collaborative effort to, to really deliver against the, the goals that have been set both from public and private sector organisations. Mm. And it, it's quite... It's quite disparate because there are local authorities that have done a fantastic job in terms of leading by example and really focusing on the public infrastructure. And there are other local authorities who really haven't grasped There's, the, the nettle yet. You're absolutely right. There's certainly an imbalance there. Um, and there are various reasons for that imbalance. Some of them is budgetary. Um, some of it is just lack of knowledge within those local authorities as to what it is they need to do. Some of it is prioritization. Um, so it's going to move at different levels and different speeds, but uh, there's certainly some areas that need to play catch up and there are others that are really setting the bench very high. Great. Oh, well, I, um, I think um, Geotab are doing some fantastic work, David, and that this just really the importance of data and the importance of helping uh, businesses develop their adoption EV adoption strategies is so important and really is a, an important cornerstone of everything that we're going to see happening uh, in the next 10 years. Um, David uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you uh, thank you very much that is all we've got time for and thank you for to Geotab for joining Greenfleet Talks uh, and uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please tune in to GF365 again soon. Thanks, Kate.